Welcome to Upthinking Finance, a podcast that offers a unique and discerning view of economics and financial planning. Here is your host, Emerson Fersh. Welcome to another episode of Upthinking Finance. Legendary portfolio manager Peter Lynch once said, far more money has been lost by investors preparing for corrections or trying to anticipate corrections than has been lost in corrections themselves. What are the challenges as a, as a money manager and as a financial planner uh, that works primarily with individuals and families is to try to figure out how to uh, explain risk and how to discern what an individual's risk tolerance really is. Um, it varies. And oftentimes just showing somebody an illustration that says if you had a half a million dollar portfolio and it drops 20%, is that going to cause you to lose sleep at night if you get a statement that says you now have $400,000 on paper? Um, many clients will say, think of risk in terms of extremes, either I don't want any, but I want the greatest amount of returns. I, I hear, I've i heard that a lot from clients with sort of a, a smile on their face, knowing that it's not realistic, but with a tinge of hope that maybe it is. And then the other extreme, which is, well, what's the possibility of me losing all my money? And the truth, obviously, is somewhere in between. But the, the challenge has been, historically, to try to help clients understand what a, a particular amount of downside looks like and what it feels like. And I can tell you, particularly from 2008 and 2009, when we had that big drop, uh, the S&P dropped 53%, clients who thought they were going to be comfortable writing out a 20 or 30% drop suddenly found that they weren't partially because of watching their portfolio drop. But the other part of it was, is all the news that typically surrounds those kinds of markets. And so it's, it's an experience that's very hard to uh, create expectations for. And oftentimes, guys like me found ourselves just trying to illustrate it with numbers without really being able to create um, a, a clear sense of what it felt like. Fortunately, back in 2011, um, software was developed to help facilitate the ability to more effectively communicate this to clients. And that's uh, our today's guest is the founder of this particular platform. His name is Aaron Klein. He's the co-founder and CEO at Riskalyze, the company that invented the risk number and is used by tens of thousands of financial advisors, including myself, to help quantify and explain and define risk. The company is based up in Auburn, California. Riskalyze has twice been named as one of the world's top 10 most innovative companies in finance by Fast Company Magazine. Now, Aaron, he has a family, includes his wife, Casey Stewart Klein, a son, Spencer, who was born in South Korea, and a daughter, Emma, and son, Teddy, both who were born in Ethiopia. Uh, Aaron and Casey founded an organization called Hope Takes Root, an initiative to use vocational training and life mentoring to change the future for orphans and at-risk kids in Ethiopia. He also sits on the board of Snappy Kraken, the leading marketing automation platform for advisors, and is also a board member of Invest in Others, an organization that spotlights and funds the charitable work of financial advisors. So it's my pleasure to welcome from his home office in Boise, Idaho, CEO and co-founder of Riskalyze, Aaron Klein. Aaron, thanks for joining me today. Hey, great to be with you. From my side of the desk as an advisor who uses your services, um, I think Riskalyze has had a huge impact um, in the industry for sure, and at least particularly in my work. So my, but my question is, I know you started off working for, as I guess, product development for an options firm. Can you kind of dive into how this whole thing started because it seems pretty monumental for something that may have just been kind of an idea that just grew out of, you know, a thought. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I have to, I have to rewind all the way back to, um, you know, the age of 12 and I started working in the afternoons after school for my dad. Um, and that just kind of taught me a love for entrepreneurial business. You know, it, my, my dad was, um, in wholesale distribution for automatic gates and security equipment. So it was a brutal business, like very low margins, uh, commoditized product, um, you know, and there were three critical things that I learned from that. Number one, um, you know, your, your, your customers are, you know, your, are, are everything. It's a relationship driven business. If you take care of your clients, like they will take good care of you. Um, number two, that, um, that you know the reality is is that all you have is your is your reputation in that world and and again if you if you invest in that reputation for uh being there and serving your 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 clients um that's going to turn out well and the third thing was that 
I wanted to be in a higher margin business than uh, wholesale distribution for automatic gates and security equipment. So, uh, so you know, somewhere in the early 2000s, uh, I kind of started, uh, you know, an, a bit of an unfocused, but I was just very intrigued by this internet thing, by, by the power of this global network and what you could do. Um, it was pretty clear to me early on that you could do some interesting things uh, with software over the web. And the challenge was, is in that decade of the 2000s, that was not conventional wisdom. Like we were trying to do stuff like that, but the tools weren't really there. The technology wasn't really there. Um, tried a few different things, mostly failed. And, you know, in 2007, uh, I, I ended up needing to take a job, got a family, had a kid on the way and, uh, you know, needed to take a job and, uh, and did that and worked for about four years running, uh, you know, global product for a division of this options brokerage firm. And, and so we're building these technology tools for traders. Um, and, you know, I'm still just intrigued by the internet and software over the internet and how that technology shift is so clearly going to change. And, um, you know, it was probably, I kind of knew I wanted to start another company, but I didn't know what it was about. Frankly, I was, I was still like thinking about that, thinking about a lot of different things. Uh, but you know, once you're bitten by the entrepreneurial bug, that's kind of there. Right. And so, uh, so I was thinking a lot about that and I'm working, you know, really kind of for the first time in the financial services world, really. And, um, I was talking to a buddy of mine who was a financial advisor. And I said to him at one point, because you know we're, we're I'm, I'm 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 meeting and talking with all these options traders, some of whom very much knew what they were doing, and some of whom very much did not, you know, and had no business doing it, right? And I remember saying to him, "It is crazy how the average individual thinks about the concept of risk." And he said to me, "If you think that's crazy, you should see how many of us financial advisors think about it. Like we we really have not had the tools in our profession." to understand who a client is and match them up with the amount of risk in their portfolios. So we end up using these very qualitative words like conservative, moderate, and aggressive. And we have no idea if like me, the advisor and my client and like the asset manager mean the same thing by the word moderate, right? And it's as if instead of, you know, we're building a house and instead of using feet and inches on the blueprint, you know, the plans just say they want a moderately conservative hallway leading to a moderately aggressive bedroom or something like that. Right. And it's, it's, yeah. it's just, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So, so that just, I, our wheels were spinning. We were thinking about that and we had a mutual friend who had actually invented and patented um, some, you know, basically a, 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 a system for creating uh, a mathematical function that represented risk tolerance. And it was built on top of Kahneman's prospect theory that he won the Nobel Prize for Economics for in 2002. But all of Kahneman's work was based on, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, nominal dollar amounts, right, with college students. And, you know, so basically he had kind of designed this three hour long process. If you can imagine the risk realized risk questionnaire with your client taking three hours long to do. Like he, he had designed this three hour long process, right? That in his words was very painful for somebody to go through, but it resulted in a good outcome. And, you know, we, we, it took me a little while, but eventually I could kind of see how you could get it to be a product. And, um, and so we decided to launch into that and uh, raise some initial capital, launched the company in March of 2011. It took us two years really, before we brought the product out of beta for financial advisors. And um, the rest is kind of history, but you know, a big part of it was that we did not turn Kahneman's prospect theory into a three hour, very painful process for consumers. We actually, as, as one set of academics said after they looked at it, they're like, you know, we've been working with the concept of monetary utility theory in the labs for years. We've just never been able to commercialize it and figure out how to get it to be understandable and usable for consumers. And that's really what Riskalyze has accomplished in its early years. You, uh, as I was thinking about this, um, I was trying to remember because, you know, and you're right about the way you describe the Internet, because, you know, the old AOL days and the little chat rooms, you know, it's so new and cool. But you look back on it now. And Somewhere I still have my stack of all the AOL discs that they mailed us, right? <laughs> and at the time, that was like, you know, really high-end, you know, groundbreaking stuff. And 
today it just seems like you know the the the, the wheel the stone and, and anyway but i was thinking how did, how did i again because i had mentioned to you before we started you know i've been doing this a while and i'm trying to remember how i was able to explain risk or get clients to see it and i and i remember this old pie chart software and i can't for the life of me remember the name but it was this thing where it was kind of what you described you had like five asset classes cash bonds uh, U.S. stocks, international stocks, maybe it was four. It's like this basic thing, and the whole presentation was if you add more bonds, your standard deviation goes down. I mean, that was kind of it, and it was kind of, you know what I mean? That was it. It's like, okay, well, I guess that's good. I always like to say if you line up 10 people and tell them what their standard deviation is, I'll show you 10 very confused people most of the time. Because as we all know, four out of three Americans are bad at math. Yeah. Right. So there, there you go. So there's a question I, I wanted to ask, um, but I guess I was going to maybe ask you if this is a fair observation too, uh, because it seems like really prior to Riskalyze, and this is again just from my experience, it, the emphasis, I, I don't know, it seems like it, you've changed it you, you, because of the, and I want you to explain in, in layman's terms how you would describe Riskalyze to clients. but. Prior to, it almost seemed like the emphasis was more on fund analysis and more on product analysis. You know, I mean, because I'm thinking I used to look back and it's like, okay, well, how did this do in 2000 to 2002? That was kind of like my barometer of what's going to happen. And, you know, because everything goes up and, you know, all the boats rise and that whole saying. But what happened when things dropped? And I'm trying to, you know, think, does that seem like a right way? I mean, is that kind of what you were competing against? Uh, I think that's right. I mean, I, I, I think at the end of the day, I don't think that we invented the concept of trying to get clients to think about and understand risk. OK, um, although although there's at some level, you could argue that there are two things financial advisors have been told never to talk about. And it's not religion and politics. It's risk and the short term, you know, and I I I. The challenge, of course, is that investors react to risk in the short term. So, you know, I, 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 but I would say, like, even advisors who were trying to help their clients understand, you know, risk, um, you know, back before something like Riskalyze existed, um, I think it was really challenging to do because you innately understand the idea that I invest in a security and the value of it can go down, but I don't know how to think about that. I don't know how to think about that relative to the other things. And then we have this massive complexity called diversification and, and you know, anti-correlation that, that further, um, you know, uh, uh, complicates the, the understanding of the issue. Um, and so, you know, I really do think that it, it, a big part of, I would argue, our success is that, um, you know, yes, my co-founder, Mike, was a financial advisor. He brought a certain set of experiences and perspective and and um, understanding to the issue. You know, I came from it uh, from a different lens because I'd never been a financial advisor. I'd been an investor. Um, and so I, I, I felt like, it, you know, to some extent, it was like a perfect match for the two of us to work together on this because... Um, I was almost coming at it from the client's seat to some extent, and it completely, you know, I, and I was really, I really had the lead role in, in kind of shaping the product because I was full time for the first couple of years. Mike was, uh, you know, still full time as a financial advisor. So he and I would talk every day, but like I really had that, that full time job of, of kind of shaping the product. And I was sitting in effect in the client's seat. And so the kind of stuff that, um, you know, I mean, I'm decent at math, so I can I can I can grasp what standard deviation and what some of these different things are. But you sit there and you try to translate it and go, how would I explain this to my dad? How would I explain this to my wife? How would I explain this to my mom? Right. Um, that that I think really created the lens that we use to build Riskalyze. And, and it was very interesting because we, we were actually pretty stubborn during our first couple of years. And we're like, um, you know, advisors were asking us to build, uh, you know, to put more analytics and more metrics in place on like R multiples and standard deviations and max drawdowns and things like that. And we were kind of stubborn about that for the first couple of years because we're like, no, the beauty and simplicity of this product is that you can swivel your monitor around and your client can actually understand the things that they see, right? And, and our mantra has always been, we want Riskalyze to be 
the tool that you use to help your clients see and understand the things you've been telling them for years. This isn't about changing how you advise. This is about helping your clients see and understand the things you've been telling them for years, right? So it took um, a few years before we said, you know, we got to build like a, 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 our, our stats feature where the advisor can click and drill into those kinds of metrics because, you know, we have clear demand from advisors saying, I want to use this to build better portfolios. Uh, but we, we've, we found a way to do it without complicating the message to the end client because, as you said, that's, that's really the key. We need to actually get them to understand risk, and that's been, um, I would argue, the big inflection point that we've helped to bring to the industry. So you may have already just done this, but if you're, if you're explaining to the client what Riskalyze does in a simple kind of statement, how, what would you say? Well, um, first of all, we very much believe that great technology kind of fades into the background so that the brilliance of the advisor's work shines through. So, you know, we have, there's a lot of advisors that have created Riskalyze pages on their website to talk about what Riskalyze does, and I'm okay with that. But I would tell you that we actually designed the product so that we kind of fade into the background so the advisor can tell their story. And from my perspective, that probably looks a little something like this. Like, look, I use this technology. It creates a lot of precision in understanding how much risk you want, how much risk you're comfortable with in your portfolio. Um, we also need to measure how much risk you need to take in order to reach your goals. That's, you know, you call it risk capacity, okay? And then, and then we need to take a look at how much risk you actually have in the portfolio. And once we understand those three things, we can come up with a pretty good answer for how much risk you should have. And when you get to the stage of, of pulling up on the screen uh, the client's current portfolio, which by the way, we discovered along the way that about 88% of clients um, want or have, or sorry, they've got you know, more risk in their portfolio than they wanted or realized. Right, so they 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 come in wanting to be a risk forty four. Turns out they've got a risk ninety two portfolio, right? And this is often articulated as, um, I just feel like my portfolio is bouncing around a lot, and I don't really understand why. They they can't pinpoint it, but that's the issue. Okay, they're driving ninety two miles an hour when they'd prefer to drive forty four miles an hour on the speed limit sign, right? And so when the financial advisor pulls that up, the conversation typically. Um, you know, goes a little something like this. Um, you're you're talking about the portfolio you want to move them into. So maybe they were they were a risk ninety two, and they want to be a risk forty four. So you know, you've checked their capacity; they can afford to be down there where they want to be. You've built them a portfolio, let's say a risk forty five portfolio or something like that, right? The conversation usually goes a little something like this: Look, this is a risk forty five portfolio. Um, you know, there's five percent of the risk that we cannot quantify for you. Those are things like 2008, the 2020 pandemic, the 2022 inflation crash, okay? Black swans galore, like these things happen in the markets. We cannot quantify or predict or guess that these things are going to happen. My job as your financial advisor is to control the 95% of the risk that we can quantify. That's kind of inherent in the investments. And so, you know, if we take a look at this 95% historical range, this will tell us that normal behavior for this risk 45 portfolio might be anywhere from down 8% to up 12% over a six month period. That would be normal behavior for the portfolio. 5% chance it's gonna be different than that, right? Worse than that. And when we hit those 5% probability events, you're not gonna hear me say, let's bail out of this portfolio because the one thing we know about 5% probability events is A, they will happen, and B, the worst time to sell is after they happen. You know, that's kind of like this New York Times napkin sketch that's sitting back here behind me at my office, right? If we are constantly getting excited about putting risk in our portfolio when the markets are going up and then we're fearfully selling when the markets go down, we can just kind of rinse and repeat until broke. And so I'm going to be arguing to you when we hit one of those inevitable 5% probab probability events, like the data is clear, we need to hang in there, the markets will come back, and then we can kind of be back on our normal track. That's, uh, <laughs> you know how we're, we don't use the word guarantee in this business? Yeah. But I will have clients tell me, well, if it's time to get out, you'll call me, you know, new clients. And I say, I, the one thing I can guarantee you is you will never get that call from me. 
Right. I mean, the time to get out, I suppose, is, you know, like like um, when you're we, we, we euphemistically call it when your need for cash flow no longer exists. Um, it's also called end of life. Right. Like like that's the time to get out. And actually, for tax purposes, let's try to move the assets on to the next generation without selling them. So so maybe the answer is never. You, you mentioned this a moment ago, but I think that one of the I mean, there's a lot to like about the software, and I want to get into a little bit of that, too. But I think in terms of giving people expectations, um, there's a couple of tools on there that I've come to really, I mean, that, that are unique, that have been very helpful. One is that six-month window you're talking about. Um, that Because what's, what's interesting about it is I've had chance uh, on many occasions to go back and show the client, you know, at a follow up meeting, look, you know, your six month window, literally it, it, that it fell right in that band, you know, so. It builds credibility, right? And it builds trust that when we hit the 5% probability event, it's like, you know, okay, like I get it. Like this, this is something we were foreseeing even though we couldn't predict it. You're, you're, yeah, you're taking a, like a real, I don't know, ambiguous or kind of this thing out there that's sort of this unknown and, and now it's being quantified in a way where it can be sort of relied on, you know, given predictability. But um, <clears throat> the other thing, and, and so maybe my question in all this, because I've, I've got these things I want to talk about, but is the stress test, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that really, I think, brings it home for people. Well, and, and, and yes, and that is, you know, frankly, the next screen most people click on uh, right after that talk track I just shared a moment ago because they're talking about those 5% probability events, right? And they go, we should also take a look at what your portfolio might look like if it went through one of those 5% probability events again. Let's pull up the stress test and take a look, say, at 2008. Let's take a look at the 2020 pandemic crash. Um, you know, when, when, we, um, when, we, when, you, when we do that as financial advisors, you know, again, we're violating that rule that we're not supposed to talk about risk in the short term, right? But it's so powerful to do so because it builds credibility with our clients to follow our advice when we get there. And this is one of the things we realized early on is I, I would tell you, we kind of naively started the company thinking about um, the, the, you know, the behavioral psychology element of confirmation bias. OK, researchers call it the mother of all biases, right? Confirmation bias is where the data that we see tends to confirm the things that we already believe are true or that validate the decisions that we've already made, right? And so we were sitting, you know, that's frankly a big reason why um, people tend to blow up their portfolios when they start to get fearful is they, they know that red is bad and green is good. So when they see green, they want to do more of that. And when they see red, they want to run away from that. And it's kind of like innately in our DNA uh, that that's what we're supposed to do. When we hear the rustle in the bushes, we're supposed to run away. It could be, a, you know, a lion, right? And so, um, so that's kind of baked into our DNA. So, so all that to say, we came into Founding Risk Alliance going, we're going to defeat confirmation bias when it comes to investing, okay? Only took us about a year to go, yeah, we're not going to defeat confirmation bias when it comes to investing. And we figured out one thing better, which was to harness confirmation bias to make us more successful as investors. Because if you think about it, every single time that you're having that conversation with a client and every single time you're pulling up the stress test and showing them what their portfolio might look like in a 5% probability event, what you're doing is you're just like reinforcing in their brains, I'm making a decision to to work with this portfolio over the long term and, and live through those those points of red and those 5% probability events towards a greater long-term outcome out there in the future. And then when we get to the 5% probability event, that's when we harness the confirmation bias because we go, wait a minute, you made the right decision back here, okay? Remember, we've talked about this over and over and over again. You made the right decision back here and now we need to stick with that decision and, and not blow it up because like this is the worst possible time to change course. Um, I'm convinced that harnessing confirmation bias 
uh, has now saved a lot of investors, particularly in that 2020 pandemic crash, particularly in the in the inflation crash run right now, because, you know, what we're seeing, here's a stat that is not um, widely publicized yet. So we're, we're breaking news on your podcast here. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm going to share in about two weeks at Summit, uh, you know, at, at our Fearless Investing Summit, this this metric. This is crazy to me, but it's proof that quantifying risk tolerance and, and quantifying portfolio risk actually works, okay? So one of the questions that we ask people, um, and it doesn't impact your risk tolerance, okay, at all, but one of the questions we ask people is how they feel about the markets, positive or negative, right? It's a market sentiment question. has nothing to do with your risk tolerance. By the way, most of the world's risk tolerance questionnaires do use market sentiment to define risk tolerance. They'll say things like, do you get a thrill out of investing? And I tell you, I got a far greater thrill in 2021 than I did this year, right? So, so you know, I, 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 that's, that's a market sentiment question. It has nothing to do with risk tolerance. So why do we ask the market sentiment question? Because we actually now have this amazing proof point about the stability of the risk number for your clients, okay? Market sentiment this year is down 126%, okay? So the percentage share of people who are positive about the markets compared to the percentage share of people who are negative about the markets has dropped 126%, okay? The average client's risk number has dropped 2% over the same time frame, largely stable. And by the way, this doesn't adjust for the fact that people are moving more towards retirement. So it makes sense that their risk tolerance is dropping a little bit over time. Okay. So you get my point. Like it's proof positive. The same people are answering both questions. How do I feel about the markets, positive or negative? And what is my risk tolerance? And when we quantify risk tolerance and help people understand who they are and then align their portfolio to fit with that, we can get them to stick for the long term. And that ultimately avoids that cycle that's sitting back there on the wall behind my head. I've often thought that drilled down, I mean, basically, and you kind of, you articulated it, that my job and, you know, my peers is to get clients from point A to point C. That, that's it. And, 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 and the, the thing that I, again, you know, I'm pumping up the, the, the risk lies because I, I like it and it, it helps. But I think the, the front end of that questionnaire, and I thought that question, by the way, was more for me. I thought that was like a gimme because I knew there was a reason. It's also true for you. Yes. It's useful to you. Yes. I kind of know this person. So if I've got one of those moments where I've got to decide whether to go a little more this way or a little more that way, their, their outlook could potentially impact that. So, But I think that front end questionnaire, getting people – to engage them, you know, getting clients to, to answer questions for themselves and the way they are to kind of, you know, it sort of works you that second one. I have to kind of explain to people what they're doing, but, you know, to get them to pretty much where's the pain, you know, where do you get to a point where the pain hits and you can't take it anymore? And so you're dealing with, it's not me telling somebody what their risk tolerance should be. They're telling me to start with. And so you always have a really good base to go back. So it's kind of ownership in the process. And I think at least that was, that was lacking from the beginning. People would come to you and you're supposed, you know, you have all the, you know, people would say, you know, like you said, you know, what, when these events are going to happen or what's this going to look like. And I, my joke was always, you know, well, if I knew that I'd be sitting on a beach earning 20%, right? Well, I mean, I, that's such a profound point because you know, I don't know if you've heard the concept of, and I and I did a, a session on this once, and there's some great books on it. Probably my favorite is Donald Wilson's book called Story Brand. But like, have you heard the concept that like every great story has a basic architecture, right? It's got a hero. That hero has a problem they're trying to solve. A guide appears along the way and kind of helps them get to the other side and solve their problem, okay? And I mean, you can look at, at movie after movie, and once you read this and see this, you can kind of see it in every story you see, right? And and all great stories kind of follow that that lens. Here's the learning: so many financial advisors um, had been putting themselves in the hero seat, okay? And the truth is, the client is the one who has to have the the courage to stick to their plan and to make good decisions along the way. The client is actually the hero in the story. The financial advisor is the guide. 
the financial advisors who comes in and, and helps the client get to the other side. Because I'll tell you what, if the financial advisor is the hero in the story, you know where that puts the client? On the couch eating popcorn, saying, what have you done for me lately? Okay. Yeah, I call that the performance derby, which you're never going to win. Yeah, you're not. the client is a huge participant in this story. We cannot do what we do as financial advisors in this profession if if we don't have clients willing to, to equip us with good short-term decisions along the way. So it's so critical for us to see the client as the hero of the story and us to play the role of the guide to help them get to where they want to go. That's actually perfect. And that I've, I've learned that it's it's not only a partnership, but, you know, I'll have clients ask me, well, do you have, you know, minimums? And, and I've never gone that way just because it seems exclusive. But what it is, is the, the requirement is engagement. I need a client who's who's willing to be the hero, willing to be a partner in this, um, because that just seems to be a success for, you know, the long term. And that's where I think this this platform you've created um, has really helped cement that relationship, particularly from the beginning, because that's one of the first things we do now um, is we send off as part of sort of an onboarding, you know, thing, the, the risk tolerance. Let's just start with some kind of an idea of where, you know, this person is and, and what their expectations are, what they're comfortable with. Um, gosh, I could talk to you for hours about this. So here's a question, and this is going to lead into how I actually, at least I think it'll lead into how I actually became a client of yours. Um, but would you, if you, you know, is there, is there a way to misuse the risk of lies? Is there a way to misuse it as an advisor? Oh, that's a really interesting question. That is not a question I've been asked before. I got to think about that for a second. I told you I was doing my homework. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Well, because I, I can share with you my perspective on that because that's how I met. But I'm curious if anything pops in your head. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to, to take a stab at it. I mean, I think I think like any product, it has the ability to be misused. And how would I think about an advisor misusing the product? Well, first of all, you know, I liked how you said it before, we don't use the word guarantee in this business. And if you were to, you know, in some way imply that what is clearly labeled as the 95% historical range is somehow a 100% historical range, that would that would be a big misuse of the product, right? Like, I, I, I try to make it really abundantly clear that there's 5% of the risk we can't quantify. And for me, that has really set us apart from from, you know, some of the firms that have kind of sprung up to try to compete with us is a number of them engage in this thing that, you know, I don't have a better label for it than predictive guesswork. They, they try to guess what's going to happen about markets in the future, and then they layer that into their analysis and try to create predictions for what's going to happen with a portfolio. And, you know, I, I've always said, like, there's a huge difference between our stress test, which says, let's run your portfolio through the lens of a historical market event and show you how it might have behaved in that historical market event compared to trying to tell you that if Israel invades Iran and there's a global pandemic and these two, you know, like, here's what's going to happen in each of those scenarios. And by the way, if both of them happen, like, here's what's going to happen then. Like, to me, that's just nonsense. Like, that is literally predictive guesswork at its worst. And, um, you know, I, the, I guess the great news is, is that, well, the great news was for a lot of those tools that they couldn't be proven wrong until like a global pandemic actually happened and they had that scenario in there and it turns out it was completely wrong. Like the stuff that they were saying in February about a pandemic was wrong by April and it was all on tape. So, you know, it turns out that you can't predict the future. And I think the, the biggest way that somebody could could try to misuse risk allies would be to try to say that the 95% historical range is the 100% historical range. And no, and that's right. And I think you actually answered this with earlier when we started, you, you sort of alluded to this, that uh, as far as where you see that the use of the product, um, I had, so the, the way I was introduced to risk allies was I had clients who, they, and she listens to my podcast, so she may know, um, her and her late husband called me, they had gone to some seminar and gotten some report from some guy that was the risk allies report. And it had this risk score of like, I don't know, 10 or something on it. I didn't, I didn't know what this was, but I'm thinking, and she says, you know, our portfolio is too risky and she was concerned. And so I, I, you know, I had to bite the bullet because I didn't know another way to compete with this other than to know the, the, the unknown of what I was dealing with. So I, so I subscribed and then 
And what I realized was it, the person was using it as kind of a, 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 a bait to try to, 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 to show that without looking at goal, what did you call it? I love that risk capacity. Without figuring out what do you need to get from point, you know, what do you need to hit your mark? And so that's kind of an element, you know, there's the, there's a planning component to this. And then there's this implement. That's a great point. That's a great point because you're right. Like great advisors do not follow the risk number around like a dog on a leash, right? Like this is, uh, you know, again, I, if we didn't believe in human financial advisors, for crying out loud, we would have started a robo advisor, right? Like that's not what we were. That's not what we were trying to accomplish. We believe that investors are going to be more successful with an amazing financial advisor, uh, you know, by their side. And, and that advisor should be equipped with the best technology to be able to explain their approach, their story. And that's why I feel like whenever I'm sitting down with the product team, you know, we'll talk about different ideas and, 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 and things we're thinking about. But it's never about trying to change how the advisor advises because there's a lot of different approaches to how advisors advise. It's more about trying to help the advisor tell their story. But you're right. You're, you're, you're you know, just doing what the you know, client says, I want to be a risk 10, you know, clearly the portfolio should be a risk 10. That makes no sense. That's not going to help the client be successful. That's like, that's like trying to, you know, I don't know, paint a masterpiece with a paint by numbers painting. Like that's just not going to work. Right. So, you know, we've got to bring the expertise that we as financial advisors bring to the table and I, I love it. So obviously she's still your client and you were able to bring a conversation in to talk about how much risk you need because we need to find the middle point there and get something you're comfortable with that matches up with what you need. Well, and, and you know, yeah, and that's how I met, that's how I became acquainted with Risk Alive and, it, you know, incorporated in my work. So, gosh, I could go on. There's two, there's two other points I want to make because I know you've got stuff and I don't want to keep you, you know, for two hours, which I easily could, I think, but... <laughs> It looks like, with, and I'm going to be showing, I'll be adding this to the YouTube, just some, some screenshots of some of the, so people can see what we're talking about. Um, but is it, this discovery, this new discovery option, it, it, it seems to me like it's, it's, an, op, it's an attempt, um, and I don't mean it like that, but I, I, you're expanding into security analysis and almost competing with, say, the Morning Stars and some of these other firms that provide more granular, just detail purely on investments, which is, is particularly helpful because it really does go hand in hand with the, the risk part of it too. I mean, it's, it's a natural thing. Is that a fair observation? Oh, uh, I, I, I think so to some extent. I mean, I would argue it's been, it's been just a natural evolution for us to move from, uh, you know, being very focused on uh, engaging clients on risk to uh, what we know. Here's what we noticed. Like it was, it was so interesting, Emerson. Um, we have analytics so we can see how people are using the product. And all of a sudden we, we saw this weird phenomenon where a lot of advisors were in the portfolio screen and they're deleting one security and then they're adding a different one in and then they're deleting that security and they're adding another one in, right? Okay. And so we're like, what are they doing? Like, are they just like really indecisive? Are they typing wrong? Is our search broken? Like what is happening? And so we, we dug into that and realized all of a sudden people are like, oh no, like this is amazing. I use this for portfolio research because I am seeing what, if I add in the security, does it make the risk number go up or down? Does it increase the green number on the on the 95% historical range, you know, and keep the red number stable? Does it reduce the risk and, and keep the return stable? Like what does it do? So I'm like, okay, well, this is this is super cool and really interesting. So that's what kind of led us to be less stubborn about advisors want more analytics to build better portfolios. So that led us down to the road of building stats and our individual security analysis tools. And you know, once we'd done that, I really, I would argue a big final piece, and we rolled this out last year, was um, advisors saying, look, like there's, there's, there's literally a multitude of options out there that I could use for my clients. I really would love to have a tool that I can use to kind of search the universe and filter it down and find ways to think about this and, and find other solutions for my clients. And so... You know, that's led us to some pretty cool uh, place, to a pretty cool place with Discovery because, um, you know, I, there are all of these screener tools out there. The user experience is pretty awful. Like you're sitting there like taking five minutes trying to construct a really complicated Boolean search, you know. 
And we just, we just turned it, we said, what if we reimagine this as almost like Google, you know, and just said, I just want to kind of type what I want. So what's cool about discovery is you can go in there and say, okay, I'm looking for, you know, a fixed income fund in corporate with, you know, two year duration and, you know, and then we can take the risk realized GPA metric, which is about risk, re re risk reward efficiency, right? And I can say, I want a GPA of 3.8 or higher. And, you know, all of a sudden we've taken a universe of, you know, uh, probably 200,000 securities available in Discovery today, and you brought it down to 10 that you could consider for that client's portfolio. So, yeah, I, I, I think, look, we're, we're very focused on thinking about a couple of things. Number one, how do we help financial advisors, um, you know, engage with clients, get clients on the right track, build better portfolios, and, um, and really ultimately, like, help their clients get to the other side more effectively. And number two, how do we help, you know, scaling wealth management firms? And most advisors who start, you know, want to start scaling their firm and growing it. And that's great. Like we love to serve single advisors. We love to serve scaling firms. But how do we help those scaling firms deliver a consistent client experience across the firm? How do we help them, um, you know, really start the growth flywheel spinning? How do we help them with the insights and analytics to understand what's working in their business and what they need to do more of? And how do we give them the compliance analytics to understand what's going on when the firm gets too large to just know all the clients, right? And so that's really where we're focused and, and where we're putting all of our, you know, R&D investment and, and effort is kind of in those two things. Thank you for saying that. I, I was thinking, um, there's a one in my office, Amy, who's growing really rapidly within the company and, and, and she's, it just kind of naturally evolved. She's been handling a lot of the risk realized work we do, but it's been a really good place for her to start in, in just explaining to clients what they've got in, in the areas that maybe we need to work. I mean, it's really, and I was thinking too, you know, going back to when I first started, uh, you know, you know, you have to start making choices on, you know, not everybody, you know, you get into this a while and you can afford to buy different things you need, but there's also a time where you got to make a choice. And I remember I, I was having to choose between two or three expenses. And I remember the Morningstar Principia, which back in those days was, at, you know, they had it on a disc, but it was these, before that it was these big, you know, like, ma you know, manuals that you'd stick in. I mean, it was huge with all this mutual fund data, right? And I chose that because that was the, that was the most useful thing at the time versus anything else because it gave me something. And so... Um, I think what you're you're describing is you're building something that just becomes a very valuable tool because it brings a lot. It's not just one thing. There's a lot of it, but yet it all connects. And so um, I like the way you said it's evolved. So just the last couple things, and then um, I'll, I'll let you go. Um, I, you know, one thing I, I was just thinking about your company, uh, and, and again, compared to some of the competitors, and I'm, I'm guessing just from this conversation, there must be some kind of conscious emphasis on a culture that's because obviously you deal with a lot of guys you're a big firm you know you've grown tremendously but i i never get the feeling that i'm dealing with like wall street <laughs> you know you have like these little coaching sessions you get and it's kind of a one-on-one -on -one. um you know even the little cute comments like when your things booting up you know or we're aligning the satellites or something i don't know to me that has to be intentional right because there is a bit of a even talking to you, you know, you're down to earth, there's a, there's a warmth, and I'm pretty tuned into that because I think, um, you know, we try to, to our, our brand, if you want to say, is really based, premised on, on, a, on a, you know, you hear this a lot, personalized service, but we're small, we're small for a reason, and um, is that fair? Is that is that an observation? that? No, I, I think that's totally fair, and I think that, um, you know, look, I, 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 that goes back to what I learned when I was 12 years old watching my dad, right? And, and I'm watching my dad, he's got the same product as everybody else. He doesn't have as much capital as everybody else. He's got one warehouse and he doesn't have all the inventory in the world. So he can't get the product to the customer as fast as anybody else can. Um, you know, and so what he really had is he had a commitment to making sure that his clients were going to be successful. Um, and a, a, a willingness to go the extra mile and a constant commitment to not treating people like numbers, but treating people like people. Okay. And, and I, that just like really impressed upon me. Now, you know, I, I risk is a very different kind of business. We've built a very unique differentiated product. 
Um, you know, you, you, you can't differentiated product is a big deal. Um, there's, I always like to say there's two value drivers in any business, right? There's, there's differentiated product and there's distribution. Financial advisors, by the way, do not have differentiated product. That's just not something that our business model as financial advisors offers. You know, I, I don't care. A lot of financial advisors try to claim it. Okay, our investment team is better than all the other investment teams. We have research nobody else has access to. We have investments nobody else can get, you know, things like that. But the truth is, like, if you really boil it down, you know, financial advisors don't have differentiated product. The reason financial advisory, uh, you know, advisory businesses are so valuable is because they have distribution, right? Like they own that relationship. They own that trust with clients. It's such a sacred bond. And, you know, there's a reason why if you look at the economics of the total amount of economics that your clients are very happy to pay to get the benefits of your advice, right? There's some fees in there that go to the asset managers that run the different funds or, or investment solutions you might pick. There's some fees in there that go to your custodian. There's some fees that might end up going to a firm you affiliate with for compliance and back office support and things like that. But by and large, like there's a reason why financial advisors are going to end up with 60, 70 percent of the economics in that relationship. OK, it's because they have the distribution. Right. They, they, they have the relationship. They're responsible for maintaining that relationship with clients. So I, I just kind of think about the world through that lens and, and all of that like rubbed off on me from my dad. And it it just permeated into our culture as a firm that and, and I, I, I I'm so grateful that we've just had uh, so many great leaders join our company. Who, who share that ethos and share that commitment and it has just like spread into our culture. And we like to say, um, we, we are trying to engineer moments of delight in you know, the lives of our customers that we serve each and every day. And you only do that, frankly, if you treat people like people, not like numbers. You know, and so, man, whenever we've gotten off track, it's when, uh, you know, somebody has come in and tried to make things more scalable by, you know, by, by trying to just like depersonalize. And I'm like, that is not our goal. We have to be efficient. We, we, we have to be competitive and keep our costs in line. But at the end of the day, like we exist to serve great financial advisors and we are serving people in that relationship. We are not serving numbers. Well, again, from my side, I, I've completely felt that, and uh, it, I have to say, it's just comforting to know there's people like you in this industry. I was listening to a, one of my associates in the office with, had me listen to a podcast, and it was about a guy who sold a, 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 a firm to Goldman, and they basically were talking about how the big, you know, this I can never pronounce this word, all all oligopoly. I can. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, all these choices, you know, you got these big firms, but they all agreed not, you know, they're not competing with each other. They're just taking up whatever market share on an equal basis, and how that's kind of where this industry is headed. And I thought, you know, it, it's not for that very reason of what you described that people are people, and you know, the structure of of a firm like ours allows us to control that to make sure we don't lose sight of that. And I appreciate, and part of our branding is to make sure we you know we're dealing with people that see that like you know it's it's not enough to just give out a starbucks card anymore uh, you know what it, it's you know if we're a small business we should be working with businesses have the same views as we do which is why another you know you just enlighten me why i'm glad to be doing business with a firm like yours um okay last like i said i could go on and on last last thing in this this point because i want to i'm going to give you some of my own breaking news i actually am a financial advisor who has a product nobody else has okay and i'll I, and this will, yeah, and what it is, is it's, it's um, uh, there's a futures trader, uh, commodity, uh, former commodities manager, a uh, friend of mine, Alex Craners in Monaco, who basically, similar to what you, your experience, he was working for a, a, an oil company over there in Europe, and the, his uh, employer wanted him to uh, come up with a way to kind of control the cost of their, you know, basically through futures contracts. Well, he ended up, you know, fast forward, he ended up developing this algorithm that's a trend following model. And I'm the only advisor in the U.S. who's created a model using ETFs to try to take this data. So uh, there, there's your differentiator for now. But the reason why I bring this up is my last question is, is if you had to pick one aspect of, of it, Riskalyze that you just really, you know, your heart, you just think, man, this, this is the home run for me personally. Um, what would it be? Mine is 
that correlation page in the statistics where it tells you your risk was like an 85, but you know, when you include these non-correlated assets, which is a big part of, you know, our work now, which is this portfolio I mentioned, it brings it down to like a, you know, a, a 40 or something. That is a real, I've, it's, you know, it's like, I think you mentioned correlation. I mean, how do you explain that to somebody? But when you can show them that the diversification is literally mitigating risk by including these non, that's, that to me is just awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I, I, uh, I guess I'll just like support that point by going one level up and just say, you know, I feel incredibly fortunate that we settled on the speed limit metaphor for the risk number. Okay. Like that was not a foregone conclusion. When we started the company, we did not see a speed limit sign or a two digit number as the key to success. We, we, we started off you know, thinking about measuring risk tolerance, thinking about like lining that up with portfolios, we're thinking about all those things. And we were partway through the process of building it. And I kind of said, hey, like, we got to have a very simple way for people to look at this and understand, like, like, it's not going to work to just have a bank of metrics, like nobody can understand that. And it was very interesting, because the number one thing that people said then was, you can't bring risk down to just one number. And I kind of like pushed through that and I said, I get it. There's nuance to it. We can, we can find other metrics and ways to explain nuance and nuance is great, but like, this is going to be powerful because it's going to help people understand. And we got to the other side of rolling it out. And the number one thing that misguided competitors have tried to say about us is you just can't bring risk down to one number. And you know, we're now on tens of thousands of financial advisors who say, Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. And um, it's been one of the most powerful. I mean, I, I and it, it, it for me, it's a metaphor for what we've got to do as financial advisors. There are financial advisors who believe that their value is driven by building up the complexity of what they do for clients. OK, and the truth is, is that is not where your value comes from. Your clients understand that what you're doing for them is highly complex. They get that the markets are complex. They get that investing is complex. They already understand that. Your value comes from guiding the, cli the clients through the complexity to a place of simplicity from A to C, okay? And, and that, is, that is so incredibly powerful. So what I love about this is, you know, it, is, it has just been a secret weapon for us because our, our misguided wannabe competitors have said, oh, you can't bring risk down to a number. We're going to do like these very complex dials or we're going to do numbers that can go to infinite scale or things like that. And it's like, guess what? They don't get it. And if the client doesn't get it, it's not useful to the advisor to tell their story. That's, per you know, my brain goes as soon as somebody starts telling me you can't do that. You know, I've just, I, it's like, Anyway, it's like a natural contrarian reaction, and I guess that's why I started that trend model. Um, listen, I just appreciate the time. Um, I got one, I'm going to shift gears completely to the left field. How did you get involved in, in all the work you're doing in Ethiopia? Oh, sure. Yeah, well, so so we are adoptive parents three times, and, um, uh, you know, I, my wife and I have never been diagnosed with the reason we can't have kids biologically. It just like wasn't happening for us right away. And we just kind of felt like, you know, this is like God's plan A for us. And so we ended up adopting three times. And uh, first, uh, our, our first son was born in South Korea. Uh, our daughter, uh, two years later, born in Ethiopia. And, you know, that got us involved in a lot of orphan care work in Ethiopia. In South Korea, a pretty prosperous country, like uh, international adoption, largely driven for cultural reasons. Uh, in Ethiopia, it's largely driven by poverty. And so we just felt like, you know, both these countries are a really important part of our family's culture and who we are. We like to say we're just your typical average Korean, Ethiopian, American family, you know. Um, and... And so, you know, it got us involved in this work in Ethiopia, um, got to be a part of helping to, to, to scale and grow a school project from like 250 kids to like 1300 kids and raise money for classroom buildings. And the impact that that has continued to have over the last 10 years is pretty cool. Um, along the way, we met the kid who became the oldest Klein kid and, uh, and he has been here in the U.S. for going on seven years. Uh, and, uh, and he's, uh, he's a junior in high school. So we have a junior in high school, sophomore in high school and, uh, an eighth grader, 
uh, this year, and uh, they're just awesome kids. That's what kind of got us involved in that, and, and we're, we're still committed to it in a big way. I know you have an organization I mentioned in my intro um, that you uh, hope takes root. If, if anybody's interested in finding out more about that, where would they go to get more information? Yeah, hopetakesroot.org is, is a great place to go to learn a little bit more about that. Um, you know, we are actively thinking about how we kind of turn that into our, our vision is to try to take um, the engine of capitalism and use it to defeat poverty. So the question is, is like, how do we almost turn it or we're, we're looking to turn it into basically like a venture capital fund that funds business uh, that can uh, actually make an impact. They're kind of like vocational schools hiding in plain sight because they're bringing orphans and vulnerable kids kind of into those businesses to give them skills and leverage the engine of capitalism to defeat poverty. So that's that's the vision for it. It's a long vision. It's going to take a lot of work, but uh, we're excited about it. You strike me as a guy who who, who, who will uh, be persistent enough until you see it through. So. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you know, that. And, and just on that last note, this that kind of comment and you know is really what this whole podcast started about. You know, I've interviewed some portfolio managers and tried to give voice to a lot of different people. But often, too, it's it's people like in charitable organizations. You know, I'm involved through a client of mine with a uh, prison ministry up in Washington, and they have this one one prisoner, one parish program where to help transition, uh, you know, those who've been incarcerated out into the world and not just throw them out into a you know situations where you can't, you know, what they call high barriers to reentry. You can search to adopt a prisoner, so to speak, and help them get connections and network and get their driver. Anyway, but it's the, the whole point is this, this financial stuff, you know, it's it's not just that, you know, it's about, yeah, we're trying to help the clients hit their mark and their goals, but what are those goals? And, I'll, you know, this the, the, the threads of finance just influence so many things. So I think that's a perfect way to end. Um, Aaron, I just appreciate your time. I, I, I will give you the, the best compliment I can probably, I think, give you um, is because of the risk allies and your vision and persistence and continue to develop it and expand it out, um, I'm definitely a 100% better financial advisor than I was before I was using it. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's that's the, there's no higher compliment because, frankly, um, the work that you do on behalf of your clients, the work that financial advisors do on behalf of clients is, I, I just think, un, un, underappreciated. Like it's so powerful to help people get to a place that they can retire with dignity and security, to where they can help grandkids go to college, to where they can change the world through generous nonprofit giving. So thank you for all that you do. And we're just so proud to have an opportunity to stand behind you. Right on. Thanks so much. Thanks for being up Thinking Finance today. Thanks. Emerson Fersh is a registered representative with and securities offered through LPL Financial. Member FINRA, SIPC. Advisor services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and separate entity from Capital Investment Advisors. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. The guest speakers and the companies they represent are not affiliated with or endorsed by LPL Financial or Capital Investment Advisors. Individual tax and legal matters should be discussed with your tax or legal expert. Economic forecasts set forth may not develop as predicted and there can be no guarantee that strategies promoted will be successful. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. There is no assurance that the techniques and strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. The purchase of certain securities may be required to affect some of the strategies. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal.